All right, open your Bibles tonight to 1 Timothy. And uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 is probably, in this place anyway, one of the most well-known passages, at least the last part of it, and probably the first part of it as it describes the circumstances of the last days, the latter days, the days I think that you and I are living in. And uh, then at the end of the passage uh, defines uh, the necessity to uh, not only exist, but to uh, continue to work and uh, serve the Lord. And uh, that is in the Word of God and our application of its truths and teaching in our own heart and in our own lives. But as he comes down and these two kind of meld together, he starts about, you know, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. He goes down through that long list of, of the characteristics that you would not be hard pressed to find illustrations of in tonight's newspaper. And I haven't seen tonight's newspaper, but I'll guarantee you if I was a gambling man, I'd bet you $1,000 that if you gave me tonight's newspaper and gave me about 30 minutes, I'd find every one of these things listed there in some prominent news story. We're living in the last days. And uh, uh, we understand saying that, that as he moves down through this chapter, he begins to talk to the believers. And this is not there to discourage them, but to forewarn them. Uh, it is not uh, given to them that, you know, it's going to be terrible, it's going to be bad, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. And if we're not careful, we can get caught up in that too. You know, uh, I don't read newspapers because it's easy for me to just want to blow my brains out after about the third page. By the time I get to the obituaries, I'm ready to be one. <laughs> Uh, it is a discouraging time frame. And uh, I'm not telling you not to read the newspaper, but I am telling you this. Those things have an effect on us as believers. I think Paul knew that. So as he goes down that list, uh, I, I got to believe, and I know I believe in the inspiration of the Scripture, and I believe the Holy Spirit is telling him what to pen, but I don't believe that the writers of Scripture were so aloof that they weren't listening and hearing what they were writing. And I'm thinking if I begin to read these things and get discouraged and think, good night, I saw that, that's going on, that's going on, that's going on. If we get discouraged, I think Paul probably got discouraged too. And so when you watch this shift back to uh, the encouraging part of the last few verses, you realize that the Lord's saying, okay, uh, these things are going to happen, but you don't have to be part of it. You don't have to be overwhelmed and overcome by these things. Uh, and the answer is the Word of God. But I want to call your, ver your attention to one verse here and uh, then spend a little time tonight because I think this word and this thought uh, is developed not only in 2 Timothy chapter 3 but in numerous other places where we deal with the last days and uh, even more importantly with the workings of the devil uh, to blind the unsaved world and to cripple the Christian who's trying to serve. And I think he brings that word into the context. It's in verse number 13. He says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. I just want you to underline it, deceiving and being deceived. I want to talk to you tonight about just the thought of how not to be deceived. Uh, you say, well, you know, I just, I don't have any problem with that. Well, <laughs> let me help you. If that's what you thought, you've already been deceived. I mean, well, you're not going to be deceived. You've already been deceived. <laughs> Uh, if you think you can't be fooled, if you think you can't be uh, somehow misled, if you think that you stand aloof to other people, then that just proves you're not what you think you are. You've already been deceived. And uh, I think there's a biblical way. There's no 100% guarantee. Uh, but I think there is a biblical way to avoid deception, primarily because it is a characteristic that is mentioned in several places in conjunction with the last days. Uh, you don't have to look very far to, to look at this world. And, and, you know, we've said it before, the world's crazy. It's, it's insane. It thinks one thing one week, and then the next week it thinks something entirely different, and there's not even any shame. There's not even any, uh, oops, I made a mistake, or, you know, silly me. It's just this, you know, this is wrong. This is, and then two weeks later, it's this is right with a bold face. I mean, deception 
you can see it everywhere you go. And uh, if the scripture warns that that's a tactic of the devil to blind the minds of those who are lost, to hamper the believer in the last days, then you and I ought to at least take the time to see if there's any way we can avoid being deceived or any way we can be strengthened to the point that uh, we need not maybe be deceived as often as we are. Uh, mankind, uh, as uh, good as the evolutionists tend to believe that we are, is about as gullible as anything in the world. And uh, you can look at some of the things that have deceived mankind uh, down through uh, the years and uh, begin, I suppose probably anybody here tonight that has email, how many of you have email? Okay, I'm going to tell you something probably 99% of us have experienced and that is the guy writing from a foreign country. Huh? Have you gotten that letter? You know, the, the amounts vary, but, you know, and it's, uh, uh, it's all in the bank, and all I need you to do is, is contact. You've heard of that? Okay. Uh, you say, well, you know, that's old. Well, if it's old, why is it still going around? I read this this afternoon. It said anyone with an email address has probably been contacted at least once by an African prince. By the way, the guy that started this is in prison. Okay, he, he's in prison. They had a picture of him, the article I read, uh, from an African prince who promises to send an astronomical amount of money in exchange for a wire transfer of a deposit to claim the prize. Uh, known as the Nigerian 419 scam. That's the name of it. Uh, 419 is the criminal code in Nigeria for fraud. Uh, there are many variations of the con, but they don't all originate from Nigeria. Uh, though the come on emails usually border on ludicrous, filled with bad grammar and misspellings, one study concluded that seven out of every 500 emails sent out by the scammers get positive replies. And of those seven, about half will send money. You say, well, that's stupid. Yeah, but that's us. You say, well, I, I'll bet the first time you got it, especially if you got it, I remember the first, I remember the first time I got it. I really do. And it was way back, probably 15 years ago now. It was relatively new. And, buddy, I thought, man, we are, we are going to pay the bills. <laughs> uh, are there things in your life you look back at now and say, silly me? <laughs> How could I have believed? And yet we're just gullible. We uh, really and sincerely are pretty much in, in a bad shape. As a matter of fact, in 2001, this is not that long ago, a large portion of Haiti's entire population was taken in by Ponzi schemes offering major returns on meager investments. They called themselves cooperatives and talked about demo, demo, yeah, yeah, making democracy uh, while giving away cell phones and CD players to entice new investors. They even created ads featuring Haitian pop stars as spokespeople. The project was tacitly supported by the National Council of Cooperatives, a government regulatory agency that obviously wasn't doing its job. When the whole thing went bust in a few months, nearly a quarter of a billion dollars or 60% of Haitian, Haitians' national budget had been stolen. That's just a few years ago. A whole country. How many of you remember the words Enron? Huh? Enron, where a few guys skated away with literally billions of dollars and left a company with 21,000 employees to go belly up. You say, well, you know, we're smarter than that, are we? These are in our lifetime. I read an article a day ago about a, the Greater Ministries International of Tampa who had a great idea years ago when someone walked in and uh, gave them this too-good-to-be-true idea and promised that they would double and have their money blessed by God. And uh, the guy's name was Gerald Payne, the ministry's founder, was a con man. 
He convinced investors that God wanted them to empty out their bank accounts, cash in their IRAs, and max out their credit cards, and even sell their businesses to invest in his scheme. He earned $450 million before being caught in 1999. We call those Ponzi schemes. You know why we call them Ponzi schemes? We call them Ponzi schemes because Charles Ponzi in 1920 became one of the first guys to gain notoriety in bilking people out of millions of dollars. I think he just in a few weeks, I don't have it all written down here, made $22, $23 million in that time, 1920 in just a few weeks by convincing people that he could take postage stamps and they would buy them. He could take them to another country and then sell them because their currency was worth more and bring back the profits. And, and it, you ever heard of a pyramid scheme? Okay. Listen, if you got a way to get rich, don't come and tell me. I'm death knell on pyramid schemes. Okay. I can appreciate the fact they sell good products. That's a pyramid scheme. Okay. I'm not into it. I don't do that. But we're gullible if we're not careful. That's why I don't do it. Because I'm gullible. Uh, anybody likes the idea that I can invest very little and get something back. And as a result, we are easily deceived. And interestingly enough, the scripture indicates that that's one of the earmarks of the last day. Not just to us as individuals seeking to live or survive or have a little money in the bank, but also to those of us that like to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just something that bad people in the world use. It's something also the devil uses very effectively against the believer. And as badly as I don't want to be deceived financially, I sure don't want to be deceived spiritually or doctrinally or biblically. It would be easy to understand if we looked at the various religious teachings of the day in which we live, and there are thousands of them. I had one of my classes the other night on Baptist polity, and I identified, if I'm not mistaken, 79, was that something? I think it was 79 different divisions of Baptists in the United States. 79 different groups of Baptists. And uh, you look at all that diversity, and I don't think all of us are so different. We teach the exact opposite, but certainly there are those who teach thou shalt not, while there are others teaching thou shalt in a number of doctrinal areas. We don't have to argue who's right and wrong, but we have to realize this, somebody in that whole deal is deceived. I'm not going to stand and pound on my chest and say we're right and they're wrong. That's not the point here. The point is it's obvious with as much diversity as there is in doctrinal opinion in this day and time, deception is not only something going on in the world, it's something going on in the realms of religion at a remarkable pace. I would rather lose my money, I think, than lose my doctrinal stability. And yet we don't take very many safeguards when it comes to our Christian life. Not nearly so many as we take with our money. I've had people told me here in the last week or so, they said, well, I put my money there because it's FDIC uh, insured. I asked him, I said, what does FDIC mean? I don't know. <laughs> You've already been fooled, sucker. <laughs> We think, well, we get this little anachronym, and that guarantees. What does it guarantee? Guarantees you don't know what you're talking about. We can be deceived. I think the scripture is probably even to an embarrassing situation, one that reveals uh, the bad things uh, about us. And one of the things that if you'll find if you begin reading in Genesis, before you get to the end of Genesis, you'll find out there's more deception in Genesis than there is in an episode of Dallas, you know. Uh, it, it's just, it's there. Deception and fraud. Did you ever consider that you can start with Abraham in Genesis chapter 20, verse 2? I like this because these verses I read all began with and, and then the guy's name. And Abraham begins there. You begin to look at Abraham's life. I understand Abraham's the friend of God. I understand all the good things about Abraham, which ought to make this even more 
pertinent in my life. If Abraham was so close to the Lord as he was, Genesis 20 verse 2 says, And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. You know what that was? That was a lie. See, somebody said, well, you know, did you ever notice somebody that's going to work their way to heaven never brings up lying? <laughs> you know, uh, that's, those, I've run around with those people off and on all my life there. Well, preacher, I'm going to tell you something right now. You don't walk the walk, talk the talk, man. You just ain't going to make it. You know you just can't sin. Can you lie? Well, I wouldn't go that far. Yeah, well, sure you would. <laughs> You go far enough that you get one of those that's obviously a problem in your life, and then you lay it aside. I like the verse over in Revelation. I don't like its content, but I like the way God constructed it when he talked about the fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable and whoremongers and idolaters and sorcerers, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns. I think he set us up there. Because we're going, yeah, they ought to be there burning. Yeah, yeah, look at, oh, they ought to. Oh, no, the Lord, you, that's just not inspired there. You had to make a mistake. He nails us to the wall with that thing. Abraham, as beloved as he was of the Lord, was a liar. You say, that's blasphemous. Oh, no, because you're one too. You're one too. Abraham told a lie. He told a lie with the intent to deceive. That's deception. That's deceit. That's fraud. And yet one of God's best is guilty on several occasions of kind of twisting the truth. Did you ever twist the truth? Got any liars here tonight? I got two or three. <clears throat> and the rest of you, by not raising your hand, just became part of that well-known group. It's interestingly enough, though, that Abraham has an effect on Sarah. Because when the angels show up in Genesis 18 to tell them that they're going to have a child indeed, the Bible says, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxen old, shall I have pleasure in my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh? Well, you go down to verse 15, and when they confront Sarah with her laughter, then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not. Can I help you? That's a lie. You say, who is that? That's a lie from the mother of the nation of Israel. God's chosen. Lied with an intent to deceive. I like what the Lord said, and the Lord's the only one that could say that. He said, nay, but thou didst laugh. <laughs> and we're going to call the child Isaac, which means giggles means laughter. So God said, you did, oh no, I didn't laugh. Well, we're going to name the child laughter to remind you every day of your life <laughs> that you told a lie. And strangely enough, Isaac comes by it pretty well because in Genesis chapter 26, verse 6, Isaac, while he's dwelling in Gerar, have has the individuals that live there approach him. Genesis chapter 26 verse 7 says, And the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She is my sister. I wonder where he learned that one from. Uh, isn't it interesting? God inspired a book that, somebody said, well, men wrote that book. There's not a man on the face of the earth would write that. We would write, you know, we're all truthful and in our own way, we're all good. And nobody's going to sit there and write, what a dirty dog I am. And yet God reveals it. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, not only that, but Isaac's wife, Rebecca. After Isaac spends a length of time over there uh, and uh, has some sons, Jacob and Esau, Rebecca takes in verse 15 of Genesis 27, the Bible says, Rebecca took goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son, and she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck, and she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son. You know what she was doing? She was helping him. As a matter of fact, she concocted the plan. To help him deceive his own father. What a track record of deceit. Jacob then, strangely enough, 
becomes the liar that stands before his father and says, I'm Esau. Deception, 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 deception. Jacob runs. You go to Laban in Genesis 29, who's Jacob's father-in-law. Remember what Laban said? He said, I want to marry your daughter. And he said, sure, work for me seven years. And he worked seven years and uh, boom, next morning he's married to the wrong woman. Some people don't realize that for years, but he knew it the next morning. <laughs> he said, what have you done? And Laban concocts some kind of a little story. You know what he's doing? He's lying. He's deceiving. It's deceit. You understand, you don't go down this godly pedigree of godly men, the godly line of Seth. I read somebody the other day talking about the godly line of Seth from which Christ was to come. <laughs> Just let me help you with that. Everyone in a row right here are dirty liars and deceivers, and you got four prostitutes in Matthew chapter 1 in Christ's genealogy. Oh. Not only that, but... Jacob marries Rachel, and guess what he marries? After they've had enough, they run off and leave their father's father-in-law's house and head out into the wilderness, and he comes and chases them. And when he chases them, he's really upset about them leaving, but then when it really gets down to the bottom of the matter, he said, not only have you left, you stole my gods. And the Bible then informs us that it was Rachel that had taken them, and Jacob says, you go in and search, and the one you find, with, find him with, kill him. So he obviously, evidently, wasn't in the plot at that moment. Either that or he and Miss Rachel was really having some rough times. <laughs> but Laban goes in there, and you know what she does? She just lies to him through her teeth. Well, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying this is an, a remarkable pedigree when you come through there. You realize these people are deceivers. But they're not so far removed from where we are. And if deception and lying was so much a part of it, and if the last guys in line are the liars to go into a lake of fire, then it's not something that ends. And when the scripture talks about being so much a part of the last days, we ought to stand up and take notice. It is easy to tell a lie. Sometimes it is far easier to lie than it is to tell the truth. And very, very often that's how we justify being deceitful. But in the last days, if I read my Bible correctly, there are two types of deception or three types of deception that are prominent in the last days. Let me give them to you. Number one, there are what I would call uh, just latter days deception. What does that mean? Deception about the latter days. Deception about us being in the latter days. Uh, there are still, I suppose, those who would say, well, preacher, you know, they've been preaching that stuff for years. And No, they haven't. I've, we've added this and we've added this and we've added this because every few years something else would happen and there's nothing else there now. The prophecies are gone. The post-return or pre-return prophecies are fulfilled to all of them. We're not, we're at that doomsday clock, you know. We've, uh, we're right there on the mark. But there is deception Concerning the latter days, Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 4, if you read the context, he's talking about the judgment of the world, the time called Jacob's trouble, the tribulation period. And in that context, he says unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. Uh, prophecy is something that intrigues us. We all want to look to the future. We all want that information. Look at how many people buy the horoscopes and the prognosticators and what's going to happen and the predictions and all of those things. And uh, They buy them by the thousands. Why? Because we, there's something within us that wants to know. Inquiring minds. And the Lord said in that context, be careful. Because there's going to be deception associated with with the last days. Deception associated with the coming of the Lord. He said in that same context in that day, many will come saying, I am Christ. He said, don't believe it. It's all there as a means of deceit. He said, be careful when you're in the last days about this deception about the last days. 
How many of you have known at least one that set the date? Yeah, if you've lived long enough, I think at one time I counted 14. 14 in my theological lifetime who have said, this is when the Lord's coming. And it was kind of, eh, 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 eh. we all missed it up. But you know what they were doing? I don't know whether they were doing it intentionally or not. I don't think they were in every case, but they were certainly deceiving people. They were wrong. This last guy out in California ruined a bunch of people's lives. They sold everything they had and cashed in their retirement and helped him get the word out and put the billboards up that the Lord was coming on May the, what was it, 22nd or the 23rd or something like that, and he didn't come. You say, well, was he a deceiver? He might have been, or he might have just been somebody that was tragically deceived and passed it on to other people. But certainly there was deception there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, there was a problem in the Thessalonian church. And in the Thessalonian church, there were people that were worried sick that somehow that the day of the Lord had already come and gone. He'd already come and they'd been left. That'd be quite an awakening, wouldn't it? And Paul writes to them and tries to comfort their hearts. And he says in chapter 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. He lays out a, a timetable and says, listen, you got nothing to worry about here. There is a timetable to the return of the Lord. There are some things that come before uh, that moment when he comes, and you're worried about nothing. You've been deceived. It's possible to be deceived in that latter day's deception. You say, well, what do you think about this new guy now? It says the Lord's coming. I don't even remember what the date is. Sometime next year the Lord's coming. Uh, you say, what do you think? I hope he's right. Amen. I pray he's got it right. But he's probably wrong. Well, yeah, but what are you supposed to do? Why don't you just live every day like the Lord's coming? See, the reason people get all hyped up about that is because they're living like the devil. And they want to believe in that because if he's coming May the 22nd, guess what? Pfft, man, I can live like the devil on May the 21st. Get on my knees, say, Lord, oops, I messed up, forgive me, and pfft, go out and get my harp and crown. But why don't you just live every day like the Lord was coming back? So there is a deception that is involved or involves itself with just the last days. It's part of the last days, and it's about or concerning the last days. And then if I read my scriptures correctly, there is a deception that I find is a lascivious deception. As a matter of fact, of the New Testament terms, there are three of these that deal with the idea of lasciviousness. I've taught you what lasciviousness is. Lasciviousness is a step beyond worldliness. Lasciviousness grows out of a worldly approach to life. And uh, lasciviousness grows out of that worldly... It's always, it comes from, whatever takes place leads to the next thing. Uh, I displayed some stuff the other night uh, that uh, we saw out, where were we? I guess we were in Boise, about the emergent church. Anybody following the emergent church? That's the fastest growing entity there is in the United States tonight. You're not following that? How many of you understand the contemporary church is in Bad trouble. Bad trouble. They're going bankrupt all across. Why? Because that come as you are, stay as you are, let's just all hold hands and sing kumbaya doesn't work. Lives aren't being changed. And so the emergent church has grown out of some of the spokesmen from the contemporary Christian movement. And their whole idea is salvation is not the theme of the Bible. Christ is not. One of the guys said something about the idea that Christ came into the world to take a handful of people and take them to heaven while the rest of humanity burns in hell is ludicrous. That's their teaching. We're always moving to something else. We're always headed. And lasciviousness is someone who didn't want to adhere to biblical principles. And so they made excuses and they adapted themselves more to the world than to the word. And then they had to have an excuse. And so lasciviousness grew out of that. And it basically is a way to say, wait a minute, I'm okay, you're okay. Judge not, lest you be judged. How many of you ever heard that? Judge not, lest you be judged. They always say it, they got that wonderful little tone. You say, well, that's in the Bible. 
Yeah, I know. You know who said that? The judge of all the world. He said, judge not lest you be judged. He didn't say you weren't supposed to judge. If you read the next verse, which would be a hard thing for most of those people to do, mental capacity cannot grasp more than one at a time. He says, for with the same judgment you meet, it shall be meted with all to you. You know what he said? If you judge, just be aware of this, you're going to be judged by the same criteria. So you better judge fairly. You better judge godly. You better judge righteously. Because if you judge unjustly, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be judged unjustly. By the way, Paul said, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Nothing wrong with judging. I'm not talking about getting in somebody's face and railing on them. I'm talking about the ability to call something right or wrong based on what the Scripture said. The idea that that's not to be done, that somehow that is evil. Woe be to them that call good evil and evil good. Uh, is some, that's, that's the lascivious approach. And you read the book of Jude. It would be hard for you to do it. It's a whole book you need to read. Uh, it's just one chapter, though. You get to it tonight. He deals with that lascivious influence at the time of the coming of Jesus Christ. Behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his saints. That's all in Jude where he talks about those who are lascivious. What is it about lasciviousness? You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 9 says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Lascivious deception can be broken down into two categories. Number one, a denial of grace as the means of salvation. The need that, well, we don't need to get saved. We're all God's children. Have you heard that lately? You know, I mean, you know, we're all God's children. He put us all together and we just do it all. We're all on the road headed to the same place. You know, different roads, but we're all headed to the same place. And uh, you can go on visitation and I'll guarantee you wouldn't spend more than an hour. You'd find somebody who'd tell you, well, you know, I think when it's all said and done, we all end up in heaven. By the way, it was one of the emergent earth authors who wrote the book called Love Wins. Nobody goes to hell. That's the new bestseller. It's eaten college campuses up. The idea that nobody goes to hell, that eventually you work it out and God works it out, and it's not this salvation thing that somewhere down the road everybody's going to make it because that's the whole idea. You understand at some point you're able to just throw your Bible completely out the window? One of the fellows that we heard address the emergent church, and that's not what I'm speaking about tonight, but it was interesting that he debated on national public radio two or three of the spokesmen that founded. And when it was all said and done on the way out, they asked a question. You know what the question they asked him? Where did you learn your Bible? He said, you destroyed us. You know what they're building on? They're building on the fact that you don't know your Bible. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But as Christianity moves away from the Word of God, it opens itself up to deception and buys into deception right down the line. This lascivious deception then falls into a category of being saved by grace. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. He goes right down the list. What is he saying? They're not going to get there. Not everybody is going to be there. You say, well, what if one of those people repents? Then they're no longer whatever it was was in the list. I like what he says down there later on. And such were some of you, but ye are washed. <laughs> You see, you might be one of those right now, but he will change you. You're not going to get to heaven by being one of those. He has the ability to change and forgive. So it has to do with salvation by grace, but it also has to do with sin's effect in the life of a believer. That's the other side of lasciviousness. Lasciviousness ends up with everybody goes to heaven. Why? Because I'm so much like everybody else. If everybody doesn't go to heaven, then I don't stand a chance. But before it ever got there, it started with, you don't have to do all that stuff. That's just junk. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, be not deceived. 
Why would he say, be not deceived? Was that inspired? Was it inspired by a holy God? Does he mince words? If he said, be not deceived, does that not indicate that somebody may be deceived about this thing? If I have a propensity to be deceived, should I not take it, pay attention? Well, then here's what he said. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means you talk the wrong way, you're going to be the wrong kind of person. What you do affects what you are. And vice versa. What you are affects what you do. You get hung in the vortex and you say, well, that's not so bad. That's not as bad as somebody else and that's not as bad. And all at once before you know it, you're down at the bottom of a barrel there and somebody said, that's a Christian? I've had two or three people this year. Well, you know, you can't judge people by, how do you judge them? Well, they said they were saved. Well, what if they're lying? The Bible lays out criteria by which I'm not saying that you're going to be absolutely right. You can, I can find a lot of Christians that are not living the way they're supposed to live. But my message tonight is not that. My message tonight is to you and to me, and that says this, I need to be aware that that can affect me too. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Did you ever have somebody that you thought highly of till you found out something they said? Hello? Did you ever have somebody you just thought lived on that saint level and then you heard them use a profane word? Don't look at me like that. You say, why? I'm just telling you, evil communications corrupt good manners. God said, don't make them. You're not going to get away with it. It's not going to be something, well, it'll just pass. No, it won't. You know what he said about offending one of the little ones? It'd be better if you had a millstone hung around your neck, you were drowned in the sea. You mess with one of these little kids out there and give them a bad idea of what a Christian is or what a Christian ought to be, and you've messed up your testimony forever. And God said, you'd be better off just to tie a rope around your neck with a big rock on it. I'm not telling you what to do. That's what he said. <laughs> and bail out of the boat. Why would he say that? Because evil communications corrupt good manners. Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption every time. You sow to this world, you'll come up disappointed. It's amazing to me, we can live in a generation when Christians are running just pell-mell toward the world. And on Sunday, we come in and we sing songs like, The streams on earth I've tasted, more deep I'll drink above. All my life long I had panted for a drop from some clear stream. That I hoped would quench the burn. Hallelujah, I found it. <laughs> it's Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing how we who have Jesus Christ can be so quick to want to run back to the streams of this world? As though somehow we missed something. Read your hymn book. You're in a church where we still have hymn books. Read your hymn book. And find out what, your, what the hymn writers thought. Read, read the amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Get an idea of what comes out of this world and you might not be so inclined to want to run back to it so quickly. Be not deceived, be not deceived. There is that lascivious deception and then there is a leadership deception in the last days. And I'm almost finished with this part and I'm going to give you a couple of things and we'll go home. This the leadership deception, meaning what? We like to look up to people. And let me repeat something tonight that I've said I know at least a thousand times. If you believe something simply because I've said it, you are a fool. I've had people get upset. They say, I didn't like what you said. Oh, good. Praise the Lord. I'm glad. Because if you just believed it because you like me, that'd show how we're mentally you were. 
You knock on a door and you say, hi, well, we go to church. Yeah, we go to church. Yeah, we are, we've been there for years and years. Well, let me ask you, what do you believe? Oh, we, we believe what the church believes. Well, what does the church believe? Oh, they believe what we believe. <laughs> Haven't got a clue. Haven't got a clue. <laughs> Truth of the matter is there's a deception that comes from leadership. Ephesians 5, the passage began with, let no man deceive you with vain words. Vain words. You know, there's a lot of vain words coming from pulpits. You know, what you need is a positive mental attitude. And what do you need is to quit your meanness. Well, you know, we just, we just need to learn to love. And, you know, what you need to do is you just need to straighten your act up. You need to get in a Bible and conform your life to what God said. Well, yeah, but I'll tell you why they preach that. Because it gets big crowds. They're not stupid. They're pretty smart guys. You know what somebody figured out years ago? If you take a little ball and cover it with leather and a piece of wood and smack it around, people will come and pay big bucks to come and watch you. There's nothing constructive in life in that, but it's big time money. And there's big time money in religion. If you learn to say what people with itching ears <sighs> want to hear, I just love it over there because he, he, you know, he makes, you don't make me feel good when I come here. Probably your oncologist doesn't make you feel very good either when he says you've got cancer and if we don't operate soon, you're going to die. I've heard people today that are upset with their oncologist's bedside manner. Tell me, what's a polite way, what's a kind way to tell somebody, you're dying? Remember 20 years ago when I told you to stop smoking? You're dying. Remember what we said when we told you to stop drinking? Your liver is eating up. Remember when you used to poke those needles in your arm? You're dying. Well, I just couldn't believe his bedside manner. The victim society. Let no man deceive you with vain words. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 says, Little children, let no man deceive you. Then there are men out there. There are women out there. There are people out there whose intent is to deceive you and I about spiritual things. Don't believe anything because a preacher says it. Open your Bible. <laughs> Most people don't take those to church anymore. Say, well, I don't like coming here because, I'll tell you why you don't like coming here, because we'll open a Bible and cram it down your throat. Amen. Well, I'd rather go over there, they make me feel, they make you feel better because they don't bring the Bible. Strange. All right, write these down tonight. How do I avoid deception? I don't want to be deceived. Are you ready? I'm going to go real quick. Number one, I need to acknowledge the reality that I can be and have very often been deceived. You say, well, why would you say that? Because most of us wouldn't admit it. Most, we're like the guy, you know, I, the guys will understand. Ladies, I don't know that you'll grasp this truth, but guys will all understand it. Did you ever do something foolish like run into a tree or fall down the stairs? What's our immediate reaction? I'm okay, yeah. Uh, you didn't hurt me. I intended to do that. You know, that's what I was trying to do there. I was trying to show you. <laughs> we can do no wrong. Our brains, ladies, they don't work like yours. Your brains are much more logical and uniform. Ours are always coming up with excuses. Probably about 30, 40% of our day is spent coming up with excuses about what would I say if somebody, you know, coming up with an answer. We don't want to admit we've been deceived. We don't want to admit that our hearts can be deceived. We don't want to admit that we're subject to deception. No, I would, I would never get deceived. And I said when I started, you already have been. You've already been deceived in the greatest deception that there ever has been, and that is that you can't be deceived. 
Start with that. Begin with that. You can be deceived. The Bible said in Jeremiah 17 verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. I'm just going to follow my heart. You've become the poster child for my message tonight. Well, I think you just follow your heart. And you follow your heart and you'll walk into a tree. The heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. That's what the God who created you said about your heart. You see some little teenage girl and she picks out a bow. And her little heart goes flippy flop and pity pat. She says, and her mama says, oh, I don't think he's the right guy. He's got some problems. And her daddy says, he's a lazy bum. And she goes and talks to the preacher. And the preacher says, be careful. And she says, well, I just have to follow my heart. Like a 16-year-old heart is something to follow. You better be careful with your heart. It's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You know the sad thing about deceit is you never discover the truth until it's after it's all over with. When your parents are railing on you and college and career kids, when, when preachers preach at you and moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, when we're opening this book, you say, I, I don't like that. I'll tell you why. It's because if we're trying to stop you from realizing too late. We make a mess of our lives. We can be deceived. Matthew chapter 15 verse 19 says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. You know who said that? Jesus Christ. You know what he said is in your heart? Nothing good. You follow your heart, you've got a recipe for disaster. Mark chapter 7 verse 21, the same parallel passage and he said in verse 19, for out of the heart proceed. And in Mark chapter 7, verse 21, it's worded this way, for from within, <laughs> out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries. That's interesting. It's already in there. It's already in there. If it comes from your heart, you ought to question it. <laughs> Wait just a minute. I fooled myself before. Number two, number two, be honest as we said in verse one, number one, and diligently guard your heart. Diligently guard your heart. Proverbs 4 says, keep thy heart with all diligence. Restrain it. Hold it back. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it are the issues of life. Did you ever find somebody whose life was a mess and they were 35 or 40 years of age and you thought, thank God I don't have to live the life they live? Let me tell you something. That started in their heart somewhere one day a long time ago. That's somebody that followed their heart. These guys go down and preach in the jails. They go down and preach in the youth facilities. They're down in the missions preaching every week. We're all over the place. You know who we're preaching to? We're preaching to people that followed their heart and ended up in a mess. You know why a drug, drug addict takes drugs? Because he wants to. His heart is filled with it. You know why a wino goes back again and again and again to a drunken stupor? Because his heart leads him there. You know why a man leaves his wife and a woman leaves her husband? Because their heart's messed up. You better keep your heart with all diligence, the scripture said. Proverbs 23 verse 19, Hear thou my son and be wise and guide thine heart in the way. Listen to the wording. Guide thine heart in the way. Your heart doesn't tell you the way. You tell your heart the way. You let your heart be your guide, and I say again, you'll run into a tree somewhere. If most of us let our heart be our guide, nobody go to work tomorrow. I suppose there are very few of us that spring out of bed at 6 o'clock in the morning going, goody, 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 let's go, go, go. No, no. How many of you hit the snooze alarm at least twice? I rest my case. You don't follow your heart. You know the right way to go and you guide your heart in the way. You make your heart go the way it should. That's keeping your heart. It's making your heart work for you. Do what it's supposed to do. 
Proverbs 28, 26 says, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Hello? So I don't, I don't, if you don't like me, it's all right. But I didn't say that. God did. God said that. Number one, admit you can and have been deceived. Number two, having been honest, now put a guard on your heart and guide your own heart instead of letting it guide you. Number three, don't follow others. Pack mentality. What's everybody doing? Oh, yeah, that's the way we're going to go. Exodus 30, or 23, verse 2 says, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shall thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. You don't follow a multitude to do evil. If it's evil, it's evil. And if everybody does it, it's still evil. And if it's wrong and everybody that you know does it, it's still wrong. That's not the popular philosophy of our day. That's not what's being taught in colleges. Public consensus. Today, truth is determ determined by literary or collegiate consensus. If enough people believe it, it must be true. I got my theology years ago, and I mentioned my theology came from Reader's Digest. I cut it out. I wrote it in all my Bibles, and it said back then, if three billion people, that's all the people that were in the world back then, if three billion people believe a foolish thing, it's still a foolish thing. And if you and all your friends believe you can't get caught, if all you and all your friends believe it'll be okay, if you and everybody you know, if your state votes and makes it legal, if somehow the whole world says it's good, it is still wrong in the eyes of a holy God and you'll not get away with it. Right. Years ago, the Baptists were teetotalers. Somebody said, why are you a Baptist? I'm a Baptist because all the trouble we've stirred up over the years. You realize there's one man that was responsible for an amendment to our Constitution called Prohibition? And his name was Billy Sunday? He shut it down. Oh, you say, it just, you know, that's not right. It's not. You know how many billions and trillions of dollars have been spent treating alcohol related problems? We're going bankrupt. Why? Why? Well, you know, we got some real problems with crime. I saw a thing the other day that said that if you take the United States gun crime law, I thought this was very interesting. I just throw this out as extra because I know we got to go. But the gun law, you know, we're just terrible on the horizon of the world where people die every minute in America with gun related violence. And, if you take the five largest cities in the United States, New York City, Detroit, Chicago, uh, I'm thinking New Orleans and one other one I can't remember. Where is it? You read that. If you take those out of the equation for gun crime, the United States is fourth from the bottom. Now, I'm not through yet. Those are the five cities that have the strictest gun control on the face of the earth. You say, well, what do you say? I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just saying, don't follow others. Don't believe it because everybody says it. Pack mentality. Well, I was with my friend. Proverbs chapter 1, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down. They always boast, don't they? And whole as those that go down to the pit. We shall all find precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. I like the next verse because it shows you where their heart is. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. You know what they really want from you? They want you to pay the bill. That's what they want. Oh, yeah, we think you're a good you. You'll fit right in our group. They, they need some money. You're the financial help. Let's all have one purse. And it'll be yours. Count on it. Number next, know the word of God and seek guidance from the Lord and surrender to the Lord's will before you know what it is. 
You know what very often we want to do? We want to know the Lord's will, and I'll tell you why I want to know what the Lord's will is, so I can determine if I want to do it or not. Boy, I didn't get any amens at all. You can tell this is a Baptist congregation. You know what you need to do? You need to pick up this book and say, your word's true from the beginning, and I believe it, and I'll follow it, and I surrender and submit to it. If it's completely opposed to what I want to do, I'll do what you want me to do, because you're God, and there's none else like you. People say, well, you know, I don't know why I don't get anything out of the Bible. You've already said you wouldn't do it before. Why should God explain anything to you? You wouldn't do it. Amen, amen. I thank you, Lord. Psalm 19, verse 8 says, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Psalm 119, verse 98, 99, 100. Listen, thou, through thy commandments, has made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. Verse 99 says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. Psalm 100 says, I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. You know what he said? He said, you'd know more than the wise people and your enemies. You'd know more than your teachers. You'd know more than the elder generation who've lived it and learned by experience. You'd know more than all three of those groups if you follow that book. Did you ever hear somebody say, well, they're wise beyond their years? How do you get wise beyond your years? You get in that book. How do you unlock it? You submit to it before you understand it. He said over there, Jesus said, if any man will do the will of my Father, he shall know. You don't know till after you will. I will obey. I will follow. I will submit. Regardless of what my heart says, I will do what your word says. You'd be amazed what God showed you. If you're willing to follow it. Number next, patience in your decisions. Wait for clarity. Don't get in a hurry. Don't get in a hurry. Psalm 37 verse 9 says, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth. Just wait on God. You say, well, everybody, I know, everybody else maybe, but maybe they're all doing it because they didn't wait on the Lord. Maybe you just better slow down and wait and let God do what needs to be done. Isaiah 40, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. We know the verse. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I need to understand the key word there is wait on the Lord. Don't get in such a hurry. Luke chapter 14, verse 28, Jesus said to his disciples, For which of you, intending to build a tower, setteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, when he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. One of these days, young people, you're going to run into some old guy, and you're not going to recognize him. He's going to say, I remember you. (laughs) Hey, did you ever? And he's going to tell you what your dream was. And you're going to say, well, it was kind of stupid. You didn't count the cost. You didn't finish it. And he knows that all your dreams were just foolishness. Take some time. Take some time. Consider where it'll take you. Consider where you'll be. I've asked people all my life in counseling sessions when they're trying to decide something, and I probably, many of you have been in my office, and this is what I've said. Where do you want to be in 10 years? Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Then head that direction. Well, you know, I see my, well, you know. Hey, you better count the cost where you're going to get there. You say, well, you know, I'm going to be president. Listen, not everybody can be president. I know they used to say everybody in America could grow up to be president. But those people all did, and they've all been president. And we've learned our lesson. (laughs) And we've come to the realization not everybody can be president. Okay? (laughs) Count the cost. You willing to pay the price to get to where your dreams are taking you? Take some time. Take some time, be patient, and wait for some clarity from the Lord. God can give you clarity.
I've had, that's probably the number one question people come into my office and ask. How do I know what the Lord wants me to do? Okay, let me help you with that. Until you do, don't do anything. Well, yeah, but what if he, what if he really wants me to do it and I don't do it and he kills me? <laughs> Lightning bolt. Listen, if you wanted me to do something, what would be the first thing in getting me to do it? You'd have to tell me, right? And if I got a funny look on my face <laughs> and said, what? What would you immediately know? You need to give me a little more information, okay? Now, you think if two human beings can get that, the God that made the world can look at your face How many of you believe God could make it so clear you'd never doubt it again? Any, isn't that true? Isn't that the God we serve? Okay, then if he's maybe intentionally, maybe he's being ambiguous, I don't know. But God can make it clear. And if you have an honest heart that's already surrendered to go, to do whatever it is, then he needs to be clear. Wait on clarity. Number next, if you are enlightened... To having been deceived, change your course immediately. You see, you said, well, you said how not to be deceived. Well, I meant in the general term. Because I can't give you anything to keep you from ever, ever, ever being deceived. You're going to be deceived at some point. If you adhere to every one of these principles I gave you, the human element enters the equation. Murphy's Law. And you may do everything I just said, just exactly the way the scripture said it. And I'm going to tell you something. The devil is still wiser than we are. He is still smarter than we are, and he is still more deceitful. And at some point, he's going to trip you up. So the reason for this one, when you discover that you've been deceived, change things immediately. Can I tell you the one thing that's really heartbreaking, ministering to Christians all these years? It's not that they fall. It's not that they fall again and again and again. It's that they fall and at some point they refuse to get up and get back in the race again. And they find them a place of mediocrity and they sponge off everything else the rest of their life. And they move to an inactive status as a child of God. You say, well, preacher, you don't. okay, it hurt. Okay, somebody fooled you. Okay, somebody told you a lie. You realize that, thank God, because a lot of people will never realize it. They'll live their whole life never knowing. You figured it out. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Now get up, get back in the saddle, and get back in the battle. Take some notes. Note to self. <laughs> Be careful of this next time. Let it be a learning experience and keep on going. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 5 says, Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. I've hunted deer for a long time and I'll tell you what, I've had deer walk right up next to me. I'm pretty good at concealing myself. I remember being in a blind years ago with my son and I said, don't move. And I had a doe breathing. I could smell her breath. She's looking. And then she backed up about three steps and gave you that real loud. Phew! And that kind of got us moving a little bit. She's trying to figure out what we were. Now, she just walked right up to us. Silly thing. But you know what? As soon as she discovered we were there, what she did? She was gone. She didn't wait around to further examine. She didn't wait around to figure out how she had gotten into that mess in the first place. She did not write a letter to a congressman. Boom, she was gone. And you know what she was doing? She was raising that flag, that white tail, and telling every other deer within 100 yards of her, don't go back there. You know what? Even if you mess up in life, even if you're deceived, you can be an advantage to other believers. 
But not if you just stay there and go, well, I don't want anybody to know, and I guess I'll just stay here all my life. And I just can, hey, get up and run. <laughs> and then lastly, begin every morning, every morning of your life, begin a fresh day. One of the worst things a Christian can do is carry junk with them from day to day. You say, well, I had a bad day yesterday, and you know, things just, and you're already working on a bad day today. Well, you know, they talked about me yesterday, and it's gonna, that's gonna occupy your whole day today. I'm thankful when the Lord gave the Lord's prayer, he said, give us this day our daily bread. All you need is to get through today, okay? All you need is to get by. All you need is to keep from being deceived today. And this morning when you woke up, his mercies were renewed. His goodness was still there. His love for you was still there like it should have been all the way through and is. His kindness is still there. You may be standing in the smoldering ruins of the city of Jerusalem, but you can say, great is thy faithfulness because this is a new day. And God's not going to hang over your head all the junk of yesterday. Pick it up, get it right, go on and serve the Lord. I don't want to be deceived. I have been deceived often in my life. I have bought one. Actually, I don't rarely buy one, but I have bought two. You know, but wait. You cannot just get one for nineteen ninety five. You can get two. So I've been fooled twice a lot of times. It's a mark of the age we live in. If I read my Bible right, one day heaven is going to open and the Lord Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords is coming back to this earth. And the Bible says that when he does, they will have gathered the armies of the world together to fight against him. Can I say as a little boy read my Bible, I didn't see how that could ever happen. I used to say, oh no, maybe it's America would be here. Standing for the Lord. Not a chance. All the nations of this world one day are going to gather together against him when he comes. That's where it's headed. I don't want to be deceived and not accomplish for the Lord what needs to be done. You know what I realized this morning? I realized this morning that evil men would wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived. I realized that somewhere around the world things would get a little worse and then tomorrow somewhere else things would get a little worse. I realized it's very rarely getting any better. I realized that sin is becoming the norm and wickedness has been accepted. I realized that people that still stand by the old paths and by the old teachings of the book are somehow antiquated and they have become a problem to this new society. And as such, they're going to be discriminated against in a way the world has never known. I realized all that. And then you know what I realized? Somebody last night cried themselves to sleep in this town. And they've been down that road and they've tasted those streams and they're just empty. And nobody loves them. And nobody cares about them. And they said, God, I need help. And I realized that today, me and you, are the only help they got. We don't want to be deceived. That's why he said, occupy till I come. Stay busy. Lift up your head and serve the Lord. This is not an amusement park. We're not supposed to get upset because the line is too long. We're here to fight the good fight of faith. Because one day we're going to the amusement park where there are no lines. Serve the Lord. Don't be deceived. Let's bow our heads.
It's easily done. Newspaper article, magazine article, little quip on TV. You find yourself just dismal, saying, Lord, what in the world's going to happen? And all at once, it just pervades every thought, every activity. We got a job to do. Let's do it. Somebody needs to hear. Let's tell. Somebody needs help. Let's open our hands and give. Let's be what God wants us to be. Let's not succumb to the negative thought of this. The world's got to be negative because there's nothing positive left. But you and I have got everything still. I'm as rich today as I ever have been. And I'm one step closer to a street of gold. We need to be busy serving the Lord. Be not deceived. He says that more to disciples, more to Christians than he does to the unsaved. Because the unsaved sometimes get deceived. But what else would there be? But it ought not to be true of the believer. Let me ask you a question tonight. You've been deceived lately? You've been carrying around the burden of this world and just kind of zipping everything up, saying the Lord's coming, and nobody wants to hear, nobody, nobody needs this, everybody hates us. You just kind of got in self-preservation mode? Or have you gone the other way and said, you know what, if you can't beat them, join them. And you just begin to pick up all those worldly things and all those worldly tenets and say, I'm going to do a little of this and a little of that. I'm just going to enjoy. Well, either way, that's a fatalist attitude. Or would I be out of place tonight to just ask you or invite you to say, listen, if you've been deceived, don't stay there. Lift up your head. And say there's still work to be done. And tomorrow's another day. And by the grace of God, tomorrow I'm going to be back at it again. Serving the Lord. And if I run into a wall tomorrow, then the next day I'm going to wake up and I'm going to go back at it again. Because some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. He will. And when he does, it will be a whole lot more wonderful to leave this place knowing I wasn't deceived than to be so sad at what I could have done and should have done and never did because I just couldn't bring myself to get into the job. Father, we thank you tonight for your word and, Lord, your commendation to not be deceived. Lord, you told us in the end of the age they would wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's going to become more of a problem as time goes on. Lord, it's such a problem that it's becoming even more easy for us to be deceived. Lord, I think sometimes you can almost hear the rattle in my own heart saying, where is the promise of his coming? Lord, sometimes I find myself even prone to move to that side of doubt. and Is he really coming? And Lord, all at once we find ourselves in a place of do nothing. Help us, Lord, not to be deceived, but to move on. Lord, I preached the other night about keeping our head. And Lord, help us in this world not to be deceived, but to Focus, concentrate, and to move with that thought in mind. Somebody needs to hear what I have to say today. Keep that thought in our hearts and minds. Help us to love you, to yield to your will. Dismiss us tonight with your blessings. May tomorrow be a productive day spiritually for all those here tonight. Because it's a new day. And there's a great opportunity tomorrow. Bless us now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed tonight. God bless you. Thanks for being here.